you know, I say things like it's time to put on your big girl, big boy panties yeah. <laughs> and look at this with a different set of eyes. If you want to have a business, then you have to learn to think differently and profit in your business doesn't make you greedy. It makes you smart and savvy. Hey, it's Renee. Welcome to the Into the Wild Show, a podcast designed to encourage women to take their back of the napkin idea, launch it, and grow a wildly successful business. I founded We Wild Women, an entrepreneur training company, to help women like you, moms and go getters, start the business of their dreams the right way. Not too long ago, I launched my million dollar agency when I was eight months pregnant with my first son and welcomed my second son only 11 months later. So I know how to grow businesses and babies. Join me as I teach you the guiding principles and how to start and grow your business while overcoming the voice in your head screaming, it's not possible. These raw and funny episodes will make you feel like you're right here with me sipping on some Pinot and leaving more confidence saying, yes, I can. Every episode leaves you with some action items and a real kick in the ass to get started. Here on Into the Wild, you'll hear from other trailblazing entrepreneurs and experts because I know that the best advice is from someone who's successfully done it before. So put your headphones on, grab a cup of coffee and tune in because Into the Wild is about to begin. Subscribe to my mom's podcast. Hey, you wild women. My next guest is a highly trusted pricing consultant and business coach working with small businesses, startups, and entrepreneurs across industries and the globe. She's also a certified pricing professional who has been helping businesses improve pricing and profits for over 25 years. Her mission is to empower small businesses to be more sustainably profitable, helping them know the value of their offer and more effectively implement their pricing, ensuring that they can confidently create, communicate, and charge for the value that they deliver. She's the host of Live with Pricing Lady, the podcast, a European public speaking champion, and a sought-after podcast and radio show guest. Watch out. Her passion for pricing is contagious. <laughs> Please welcome the incredible Janine Liston. Hi, Renee. Hi, everyone. Thank Not you for Jenny. having me here. <laughs> <laughs> Janine, Janine. So before we start off, I just mm-hmm. have to say how awesome it was in the way that Janine reached out to me. I believe it was on LinkedIn. She found me. And you have to understand, I talk about this a lot, about how I get pitched a lot to be on the show. Some incredible people, but the way that you did it was she shot a video. It was like a loom, I think. Mm -hmm. And in the background, she had her laptop open on my website. And then she was waving back and forth her iPad that had my name on it. (laughs) And so like, if you open this up in LinkedIn, I was like, oh my gosh, that's my name. It's kind of like, the voice notes and a direct message on Instagram. It's like, you can't not listen to it. Like, what did that person say? So I was like, wow. And being a PR person, it was just fascinating. I was like, oh my God, this woman gets it. That's how she got me. And I was like, yes, I want her on my show. (laughs) (laughs) And here we are. Well, welcome, welcome. And we're going to talk about all things pricing today. So let's start off with some quick questions. And it gives our listeners a chance to get to know you better faster. Are you ready? I'm ready. So where are you from? I grew up in Sacramento, California, but I currently live and have lived for the last 20 years in Basel, Switzerland. Wow. Switzerland with all the chocolate. (laughs) Chocolate, yes. Chocolate and mountains and Chocolate cheese cheese and and mountains. Perfect. Sign me up. And what's one of your favorite quotes? One of my favorite quotes is from Zig Ziglar. I'm going to paraphrase here because I don't remember it exactly, but it's, if you see a turtle on a fence post, you can be sure he didn't get there by himself. (laughs) (laughs) It's about, you know, we all need help sometimes. Yes. So then if you're dressed as a turtle sitting on a fence post, it's a signal that you need help. (laughs) (laughs) It gives me this great image because the turtle on a fence post, his legs would just kind of be flapping in the wind. How would he have gotten up there? (laughs) True. Somebody definitely helped him. Okay. I love that. Zig Ziglar is a good one. Okay. So what's one of the best pieces of business advice you ever received? Keep it simple. 
I just go back to that time and time again. It's easy to get lost in the complexity and trying to be flexible and all of these things. And when you find yourself spinning your wheels, stop, take a step back and ask yourself, how can I make this simple? Simplicity is the ultimate form of sophistication. Mm -hmm. Precisely. What is one of your biggest business mistakes? Mm. Too much, what I call drawing at the whiteboard. Yeah. So trying to make it perfect and so perfect and so perfect before I just let it go out there. And I did that quite a bit in the first year or so. I was just so engrossed in like making it perfect before I put it out there. And it didn't get me very far, very fast. No. (laughs) And I learned there's a time and place for things to be precise. I don't want to use the word perfection, but to be more precise. And there's a time and place to go off the cuff and just let it roll. And part of the intuition you develop is when to use what. Angie Lee says it best is perfect is a lie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And they say done is better than perfect. All these things. Actually, I think the previous episode or one of the episodes that went live a few weeks ago with Amira Alvarez, she talks about Mm -hmm. how nothing is impossible. She says, I am possible. Mm -hmm. And part of most women's roadblocks, and I'm just going to assume yours too, is you were just so worried that it wasn't going to be perfect enough. People weren't going to want it, but you don't know Mm -hmm. unless you actually put it out there. Well, and that's absolutely the thing. I mean, you can sit there and create this supposedly perfect thing, but you don't really have any idea if it's fit for purpose or what people are looking for or delivered in the right way. Maybe it's the right information, but delivered poorly. You don't know those things until you start tossing it out there. So I found that sometimes it's better to toss it out there before it's even finished and see what happens and then adapt it. It's again, it's like you have lots of options. You don't have to wait for perfection or sometimes you're not going to want to throw it out there before it's at least a little bit developed, but you kind of develop your own intuition and what works best for you with that. And I've stumbled through that a lot. And it's always like, it's an iterative process because you're just going to keep stumbling. It just happens. (laughs) So what is one book that you could recommend today? One of my favorite books is probably, let me do this one for women, Playing Big by Tara Moore. I absolutely love this book. She is a great coach and her book is so simply written that it's very easy to read. It's very practical. And she talks about things like why women aren't playing bigger, why we hold ourselves back, how we hold ourselves back, what we can do with it. And what I really enjoy also is she has a guide for how to run a book group based on her book. And so she has this nice little guide. So from time to time, I would actually run book groups on that book (laughs) with clients because it was so fun. And so I've been through the book. I've probably read the book at least 20 times. Oh, wow. And I've run about 10 book groups on it because okay. it's so practical. I love it. So mm-hmm. Playing Big by Tara. Tara. T-A- okay. T-A-R-A. T-A-R-A. And T-A-R-A. Tara Moore. M-O-H-R. M-O-H-R. All right. So let us dive into this pricing stuff. First of all, as you giggled to before, is I didn't know that there was actually a thing called a certified pricing professional. Mm -hmm. And I get it because pricing is so hard to understand. People don't understand how to price their thing. And right now I'm going through all of like Stu McLaren's stuff about creating Mm -hmm. memberships because he talks about pricing. And it's almost like there should be a formula. There should be this magical formula where you just plunk in these little numbers and things and all of a sudden, (laughs) poof, there's your price, right? It does not exist. So tell me, how did you get in to this Mm -hmm. business and becoming the pricing lady? So originally in my career, I started as a structural engineer designing buildings. And then after Those two go hand in hand for sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) But I always like to start there because it actually plays into what I do now in some ways. And so I also like to tell people, just because you studied one thing doesn't mean you can't do something else later on down the road. Some people don't see the possibilities that the skills in one area gives them in another area. And I think that that's also part important, especially when you're starting your own business, because you do end up doing so many different things. After a few years of that, I loved some aspects of it, but it wasn't social enough. So I went and got a job as a product manager in a company that makes high voltage test and measurement equipment, which is extremely sexy sounding. (laughs) How do you find these jobs? (laughs) (laughs) 
at that time, probably it was the newspaper, right? So this is more than 30 years ago. Wow. Okay. (laughs) What happened is when I got there, the first thing they gave me was the price list for my product line. And it was 20 years old. And even though I, I mean, I was about 26 at the time. So even though I didn't have a whole lot of business experience, like operational or commercial experience, I knew enough that there was something wrong with that. And so that combined with the fact that it was taking us days, sometimes weeks to get offers out the door, I knew something had to change. And so one of the first things I did was I restructured the pricing for my product lines. And then I went and restructured the pricing for the rest of the company over the next year or two, working with the service department, working with the spare parts department. That was really my first foray into the topic, but it wasn't my focus at the time. That's so interesting. So what were these products that were listed? So for example, when you have a power cable, like a power line, you have to test those cables for things like lightning strikes or that they carry the amount of power that they need to carry. And we made the equipment that would do those tests, basically. So I used to say to people, we make lightning because we literally, one of the (laughs) units actually made lightning strikes so you could test power cables and airplane engines and things like that. That was the cool part. (laughs) So you saw this discrepancy Mm -hmm. between the cost of the products that you were selling and what their value was today. Yes and no. I can confess that in some ways, I didn't really understand all of it. Looking back now, I can really see, but I'll give you a simple example. And then we can talk about how I got into my business. So we had a part that we made. And I took just a random part from the list of spare parts that we had. And let's say at the time, we were using a cost plus methodology for setting prices. And let's just say, so I can do the math easy. We applied a 10 times material cost and that was the price. Well, this part cost us $1 in materials to manufacture. So we were selling it for 10, but we manufactured everything for raw materials. So that meant it also took one hour of labor. And the cost of one hour of labor fully loaded at the time was $75 an hour. So we were selling something for 10 that at a gross profit level was costing us 76. That didn't even include things like salaries for the employees and the buildings and whatever. So already you can see, wait, something's wrong here. But then it got even more interesting because then I went and looked at, okay, what's the competition doing? What do they have that's similar to this part? And they were selling a similar part between $90 and $120. Then it gets even more interesting. Our spare part went into a unit that regulated the power in the whole system. And it had a fail-safe on it. When there was a short somewhere in the system, it would click off a circuit breaker and protect it, which basically shut everything down so it would be protected. The competitions didn't have that part. So from a value perspective, we had the potential to be charging even more, but we were charging 10 bucks. 27-year-old girl who doesn't know much (laughs) about the industry comes in and now all of a sudden turns this business profitable. (laughs) I mean, I identified the problem in my area and then I started just kind of looking at what was going on in other areas. So then I could go talk to my boss and the team about it and then, you know, we could do it. But you know, and then they're like, oh, well, that's really interesting. I mean, this was a service and spare parts. This should be a cash cow, right? 100%. That's how most businesses make their money <laughs> like that is off the spare parts. <laughs> so yeah, I won't say that I did everything, certainly not, but I was getting the ball rolling and helping them understand this just because of my own natural curiosity at the time. A little bit of a dog with a bone. <laughs> so, but then, so then this kind of snowballed into what you're doing now or... So I was working for that company. They bought a Swiss competitor and that was how I ended up in Switzerland. I came over here to help with the integration. And then after two and a half years, they said, well, that was fun, Janine. It's time to go back to the US. (laughs) And I quit (laughs) and found a new job here as a global pricing manager for a local company, a large multinational. And about six months, well, about six, yes, about six months into that job, My boss changed and he confessed to me one day, I don't know what you should be doing. And I said, well, we're all still trying to figure that out. (laughs) I found this thing called a certified pricing professional. Why don't I go figure it out? (laughs) 
so I was doing what they wanted me to do and I was finding my way. It was a new position for the company. And so we had the opportunity to make it what it needed to be. And getting that certification really helps me to understand how I could best help the company and what things we could and should be focusing on. Cool. And then? (laughs) And then I worked at another company and went through a burnout. And then you launched? And then I decided as I was healing, I had thought about my own business because I knew that this pricing topic, I could really bring a lot of value to companies. But I was standing at, I call it the entrepreneur's cliff. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You stand and kind of look over the edge, but you don't dare. So I had been there for a couple of years. And when I was recovering from that, it became clear to me that I wanted to have a different lifestyle and that I really wanted to help small business owners have more financial freedom because they understand how to use pricing to be sustainably profitable. Okay. So then let's just jump into that. Oh, I got there. Head first. Let's jump off. Yes, ma'am. All right. (laughs) So pricing is one of those things Mm -hmm. where it's like, I feel like people just shoot in the dark. They're like, this sounds good. That's what it's going to cost. And mm-hmm. a lot of people are like, well, this is what it costs me. Let's just times five and that's going to be my cost. So we're going to get into that. But when yeah. should a business start pricing? And like, what exactly is pricing anyway? My experience is that the earlier you start with it, the better. And here's why. If you're any kind of business, you've got to know how you're going to make money. What's the business model? How are you going to earn an income from it? You can't do that if you don't have an idea of the price that you're going to sell at. If you're looking for investors, you can't explain the revenue story and the business model without understanding what you're going to sell and at what price and how many you need to do it. So the sooner you start with that, the sooner that you can actually understand and start to see how successful your pricing model or your business model is. Otherwise, you're just kind of hoping that it'll all work out. Now, I love that you ask what pricing is because this makes me realize that you understand it's probably a bit more than you realize. Oh, it is. So most people think that pricing is the search for this number, this nirvana, this beautiful, magical number that when you finally find it, anyone and everyone will buy from you and no one will ever question the price. That that doesn't exist? No. (laughs) (laughs) We've been duped, guys. No, but the good news is, is that it's a range of prices that you can operate within. So instead of looking for like a single point, you're actually looking for a range, which is easier to find, right? But setting a price, just having a number that you put out there isn't enough. You have to be able to set, to get, and to manage the prices over time. I always tell people that pricing is a way of being or behaving. So be behaving in in your business because it's actually about understanding how the decisions you make affect profitability because almost any decision you make in a business will have a consequence or could have an impact on what you charge and therefore your ability to drive profit. You want to sell to this customer versus this one, that will probably have an impact on your price. You want to source your materials from here instead of here, that will impact your price. You want to have a fixed building versus an online business, that may affect your price. Every decision you're making has some influence on it. And you can make better business decisions when you understand how they influence your ability to be profitable. Yeah. And also how people perceive you too. Yes. That's why. So If your definition of pricing is just setting a price and finding it, you're missing two-thirds of the equation. Mm -hmm. Getting the price is all about the communication, the psychology, how you respond when someone says that's too expensive, how you place your prices on the website, what other things or text you have in your offer. I see offers all the time. I would say probably in some parts of the world, it's better. But I would say at least 60% of people, when they send a written offer, it looks more like an invoice than an offer. Ooh, okay. So then how would you define an offer? Well, let's think about it. What is the purpose or the intention behind an offer versus an invoice? I'm just thinking like, I just paid an invoice to get my fridge repaired. Right. But the intention of the invoice is to get you to pay them or to get your client to pay you. But the intention of the offer is actually Mm -hmm. ultimately to sell to them Before you can sell to them, they have to understand the value. 
because otherwise they can't put the price into context. Well, they can, but they may not be judging it based on the right information. So an offer should actually, in my experience, first contain information about the value you're providing. Then you can tell them about the logistics. Then you can tell them about the price. And then you can talk about the conditions for which that price is valid. Reminds me of that quote where it's about a plumber and he went in to fix somebody's toilet because it wasn't Mm -hmm. flushing. And he was in and out in like five minutes and he just replaced a 10 cent piece. And then he billed the people like $1,000. They're like, why did this cost $1,000? took you five minutes and a 10 cent piece. So the response goes, I'm not charging you for the five minutes it took me to do the job. I'm charging you for the 10 years it took me to do the job in five minutes. Like the 10 (laughs) years it took me to learn that it's only a 10 cent piece and not a $10,000 piece. And there's the perception of the plumber too. It's like, well, the plumber Mm -hmm. shouldn't cost that much. That guy does. That's the offer. The offer is the speed of knowing which piece quickly in and out and you're good Mm -hmm. to go move on. Next thing. (laughs) Yeah. And feeling comfortable that he did it right and it's not going to break again and flood your bathroom or you're not going to have to call him again 10 minutes later. (laughs) Exactly. I mean, imagine I tried to change that piece. It would cost me a whole new bathroom. (laughs) I mean, first you'd have to know that that is the piece that needed to be changed. And that might even be more of what you're paying him for, right? (laughs) That is 100% what it is. Like, I'm sure I could find it on YouTube, but do I even care to learn that information? It's not necessary. So I always tell people that a lot of people, especially women, I hate to say this, ladies, but many women have a very different relationship with money than your average guy does. It's just the way we've been raised and the way things have gone. It's getting better. I have something new and exciting to share. Something that I've been working on for years. Having personally coached hundreds of female entrepreneurs on all things launching and growing a dream business, I knew that these women, much like you, needed more. Something special, inclusive, and worthwhile. A place to go to have meaningful business discussions, ask questions, gain access to expert advice, and connect with amazing people. It's called The Wild Collective, and it's open now for you to join. When you join The Wild Collective, you'll get access to a trusted and uplifting community, game-changing training and content, world-class expert sessions, business secrets from the experts themselves, templates and tools to help you skip the messy middle and go straight to building a wildly successful business. The results are already coming in. Ali Monroe of Care Dental explains, the Wild Collective has helped me achieve my business goals and work the right tasks into my schedule on a consistent weekly basis. And I get held accountable to a group of amazing entrepreneurs who ensure I'm executing on all the small goals that it takes to achieve the big ones. Hannah Hain explains that the Wild Collective is an amazing community. What I love the most about it is the connection with other incredible women in business, celebrating wins, sharing tips, and offering support and lifting each other up. It's this community environment that makes me want to stay accountable to my business goals on days that it feels hard to. Everyone wants you to succeed and you can really truly feel it. See, I've always dreamed of making my coaching practice more accessible to women who are launching and growing their dream business. And this is why I started The Wild Collective. The best part is that it's open right now for you to join today. So head on over to wewildwomen.com forward slash membership. That's www.wewildwomen.com forward slash membership to join for just $99 a month on an annual basis. So go ahead, click on it. And I can't wait to see you there. What is the one thing that women do? What is the thing that they're like, you say, especially women do this. They undervalue themselves, totally undervalue themselves. And it's so disheartening to see that for whatever reason, I'll confess, I'm sure I've done it myself. I know I've done it myself from time to time in my business, when I was in the corporate world. And there's no good reason for it, except for that it's just there and present. And I'm not always capable of confronting it in the moment. 
But when it comes to your business, there has to be a point where you think differently. You know, I say things like, it's time to put on your big girl, big boy panties. Yeah. <laughs> and look at this with a different set of eyes. If you want to have a business, then you have to learn to think differently. And profit in your business doesn't make you greedy. It makes you smart and savvy. I'm not talking about chasing after profit at all in any cost. We're talking about understanding that in order to be there and continue to do the things that you want to do and serve the people you want to serve, you have got to understand how you can be profitable. Without that, you're just kind of playing around. It's an expensive hobby. Yeah. A fun one, nonetheless. (laughs) There's just so many nuances too and understanding like profitability because there's a Mm -hmm. lot of listeners that have companies that are product-based, you have huge overheads and you have loans and you have investors and you're paying people back. Pricing, I can only imagine, it's actually very difficult to figure right. out. And here's the last thing. So we talked about setting and getting, but you also have to manage those prices over time, which mm-hmm. is knowing when to make changes, how to make changes, what changes to make, and how to do it all without messing things up, you know, without really ticking off your customers, unless that's what you want to do. Because sometimes you do want to rock the boat. But most people don't make changes out of a fear that any change is just going to disrupt whatever delicate balance they think they have. But most businesses can sustain bigger price changes than they think they can. Really small businesses, right? When we used to manage our CrossFit gym Mm -hmm. on the East Coast, my husband came in as like a small partner in the business, mostly to help with business advice. Mm -hmm. Coach Matt, super awesome guy, like the epitome of the best coach you can have in CrossFit. Loved working with him. And part of the thing that my husband suggested was increasing prices. And he pushed back. And he's like, oh, I can't do that to my members. He's like, people will leave. I'm like, of course people are going to leave. But here's the thing about Possibly. those communities. If they're so small, you sweat with these people like every day. They're like family. They do become family. And I think the moment he put up his prices in order to cover his costs and make mm-hmm. a little money too, he maybe lost like four or five people. Everyone yeah. else stayed. No one made a single, like didn't blink an eye at this. Yeah. And it attracted more customers. And so all of a sudden he went from like earning X amount, losing a couple, but earning 10X because he increased it. And it wasn't like from $100 to $200 a month. It was a decent, significant. Yeah, this is a missing, you know, unless you're trying to be the low price leader in a market. Like Walmart. Right. Generally, you will benefit from making price increases on a regular basis. Now, you don't have to raise them 50% necessarily, but you'll benefit from yearly or every other year doing something with your prices, unless you're trying to run with a low price strategy or the low price leader. Now, a small business generally can't sustain being a low price leader because they don't have the ability to have the lowest cost basis in the marketplace either. They don't have a small business. Exactly. (laughs) So there are exceptions to that rule, but that means that most people don't understand is that or what most people don't do, let me say not understand, what they don't do is they don't do the math behind it. So Mm -hmm. let me ask a question. If you have a product that has a gross profit, gross profit is if my price is 100 and my material cost to manufacture are 60, gross profit is 40%. Yeah. Okay. I never assume people understand all the math. So I try to make that clear. So if you have a product that has a 40% gross margin, and you decide, I'm going to reduce the price by 10% because it'll make me more money. The question is, how many more units do you have to Mm -hmm. sell in order to break even? Oh, I don't know. I don't do math that fast. You have to sell 33% more to break even, So which is massive. So the question is saying, if I lower my price, I'll get more customers, but then you have to do more work to get those customers. And the cost to acquire a new customer is more expensive than the cost to keep an old one. And where are they going to come from? Exactly. And is it sustainable? No. In all the years I've been doing pricing, I've seen one case where we lowered prices and got more volume, but then the next year the competition dropped their prices and all of a sudden we found ourselves in a price war. So it wasn't even sustainable. So the important thing to take from this is that you have to do the math. You have to understand where the break-even point is 
33% doesn't mean you make more money. It means that you've earned about the same, yep. assuming your costs have remained the same, right? Which they might not, as you pointed out. So it's not until the 34th percent, sounds like a weird <laughs> statement to say, but you know what I mean, that you actually start earning more. And here's the real kicker. What if you raise your price by 10% on a 40% gross product? Mm-hmm. You can stand to lose about 20% of your customers and still break even. And what are the chances that you would lose 20%? It depends on the business, but for most small businesses, their prices aren't that elastic. I mean, a 10% price increase on a lot of things is really small. People would barely even notice it. If it's something they're purchasing every day, it might be different. Well, I hope I have a business that somebody purchased from every single day. That'd be great. (laughs) Well, no, but like if the same person was something that you were buying, you were buying personally every day you would notice it more. Just like if it was monthly, you might notice it more, but if it was yearly, you might notice a little bit less. The real point here is that if you don't do the math, then you can't answer the questions. Where are the extra sales Mm -hmm. or customers coming from? And is it sustainable? If you can't answer those questions, then you don't really know if it's a good thing to do or not. So then I'm just thinking of instances where people maybe come in overpricing themselves. Mm -hmm. So how do they adjust from that? I would say you usually find that in young businesses. So that's typically where you find... It happens less often, but it does happen. Thankfully, because they're young, they can usually adjust fairly quickly. And it also depends on the market because if they're in a market where it's the same customers buying the same thing, then people may see that and wonder, okay, well, last year I paid this for it. And this year I'm paying this for it. I don't really understand what's going on here. You know, they may question it and start to question. It may start to erode trust a little bit if you're not careful about how you do it. It's not doing it, not lowering them. That's the bad thing. It's usually how people end up communicating them that actually creates the problem, both when it comes to price increases and price decreases. The communication Yeah. So Netflix increased their price like two times in the last year. Yeah. And they can can do that. I know. And they will probably continue to for a while. Well, I mean, think about it. Hopefully nobody's listening, but (laughs) five bucks a month is a pretty good deal. I mean, when you think about how many hours on average does a person spend watching Netflix? Right. If you take everybody, even those who don't, you average it all out. And then you divide that number of hours into what you pay, you're probably paying five or 10 cents per hour, which yeah. is pretty ridiculous. <laughs> pretty good investment. <laughs> it's warranted. Like every time I got the price increases, I'm like, yeah, because don't ask me what I'd be willing to pay for this month that you don't want to know. So sure, 20 bucks a month. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Make it 25. Why don't you? Okay. Yeah. So what are some mm-hmm. of the biggest mistakes that people make when they're pricing their offers? So in my opinion, when people are just starting out, one of the biggest mistakes they make is they think they have to be cheaper at the beginning. And so they do things that actually destroys the value. And I see this all the time. And my advice or my experience shows, especially with small businesses, set your price where it needs to be. If you feel you need to make special offers to get the first few sales, do it, but then meet the golden rules, make it time constrained, make it scarce. And there's a third one, which I can't remember off the top of my head right now. But if you apply those rules or conditional, that was the other one, the third one, make it conditional. So they have to order it by the end of the week or in exchange, they have to give you something. So add a condition to it. Because then as long as you always communicate the real price, So this is the price, establish the value, but as you're a valued partner, I'm going to do this offer for you in exchange for this, but you have to tell me that you're going to do it by the end of the week. Then they know next time if they buy it again, that the price is going to be over here. And I guess the listeners don't see my hand (laughs) in the air. (laughs) But because here's the thing, you want the prices that you have, even at the beginning, to be representative of the value that you deliver. But with women, we undervalue ourselves. Yeah, I know. So is it easier to increase a price to go towards your value or is it easier to lower price? I'm not sure if easier is the right question. I'll challenge you on that. (laughs) I would say 
what is going to help you to hold the value better? That's a great is, question. <laughs> is actually you being clear up front, what really is the value that you offer? I find this that most people, one, they don't really know how to define what the value is. Second of all, they don't know how to quantify it. So even if they know how to define it, they feel nervous about quantifying it. And when I do this, I take my clients through this price setting thought process. Usually we get hung up at the value piece because they're like, yeah, but I can't guarantee that. I'm like, I'm not asking you to guarantee anything. I'm just asking you to understand what the economic value is because it becomes like this little secret that you know. Yep. Nobody else knows. Right. And it gives you that little boost of confidence. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah. Huh? I don't know if you remember, there was a commercial, I think it was for Kix cereal back in the 80s. There was a little kid, I think it was Kix. And there was a little boy and he's asking his older sister, you know, what does this say? What does this say? And she goes, I know, but I'm not telling. <laughs> <laughs> I don't and think I we had those there. commercials here. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> But yeah, so if you understand the economic value, now you can choose to share it with clients. You can ask them questions to help them start to do the math in their own head. Or you can just go, yeah, I know that my price is reasonable and fair because I know that the potential value that you can get out of it is way up here. And you knowing that gives you that confidence. Yeah. So then the brainstorming, the journaling needs to be about the value that you bring. And so part of like my PR process is mm-hmm. writing your story, your why, why you're doing mm-hmm. this for your business, because that's what the media wants to hear. And why I say start with the media kit is because you have to define your story mm-hmm. and it forces you to get uncomfortable and forces you to ask questions and test your messaging out. And then going back to that plumber example, it's like most people see the value of a plumber as maybe a hundred bucks an hour, but it's he or she higher. is worth way more because... They just know. They know what to do, what to fix, how to fix it. The alternative is you can figure it out yourself. So it's going to waste Mm -hmm. you time. It's probably going to cost you more money Mm -hmm. anyway. Like I remember we hired a plumbing company to come in and to replace a toilet that I bought. So I bought the new house and the previous owners had a black, really short toilet in the powder room. We couldn't figure this out. (laughs) And so we wanted to just buy a standard toilet. And Mm -hmm. when the plumber came in, he's like, well, what do you want me to do with the old toilet? We can take it for you. And I'm like, first of all, I didn't want to bother him with it. I thought it was going to be a surcharge included. I was like, no, no, it's okay. Like, I can just do that. Don't you worry about it. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't even know where to bring it. (laughs) Let alone like switch out the toilet. Like, what do I do with this old toilet? And so like value to me was maybe there was a premium in him discarding this toilet was like, I don't have to worry about it. I already Mm -hmm. knew that I was going to have to pay a certain amount for this project. Mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about where that's going. The value to me is that he just shows up, does his thing and he leaves. Mm -hmm. Boom, done. Right. You bring up one of the most basic of the value points, if you want to call them that. And that is any customer, any client, when they're looking at purchasing something, they usually behave for time rich or cash rich. Mm. My dad, he loves it when I tell this story. When he buys an airline ticket, he'll spend weeks researching it to save $100 a ticket (laughs) for him and my mom. So it's like 200 bucks, but he's, you know, he's given up weeks of his life. Me, when I buy a ticket, I'm like, I want to fly direct and I'm happy to pay more for it. So I just go to the airline that flies as direct as possible and I buy that ticket. (laughs) He behaves like he's time rich, cash poor. I behave like I'm cash rich, time poor. When my dad buys gardening equipment, he behaves cash rich time. (laughs) And if you just even look at that in the context of what you're offering and who you are targeting, then you already understand some of the value behavior that you can leverage, if you will, in your communication and therefore help you get the prices that more represent the value that you bring. And I would default to, especially female entrepreneurs, if you're investing into any programs too, if you're mm-hmm. investing into a membership or to work with the pricing lady, <laughs> is understanding that really what you're trying to do is you're gaining your time back. All of this stuff is you have to buy back your time because you're outsourcing essentially all your time to people that already have that experience and can just pay it back in spades. My husband's actually writing a book right now. Mm -hmm. It's called The Buyback Principle, where he 
teaches you that like, there's certain investments and in people you have to hire within your business in the first couple of years in order for you to really be successful. Mm-hmm. And entrepreneurs somewhat tend to be apprehensive. They want to like hold on to their cash. They're worried about spending it because they just don't know what's going to happen. Like I have a client that's like just sits on hundreds of thousands of dollars of cash because she's always worried about that rainy day. I'm like, yeah, that's yeah. great. But to grow your business, you need to use that yeah. as leverage to invest in an employee. Yeah. And sometimes it feels a bit premature, but you're like, okay, I'm banking on this working out. And other times you do it with a little bit more certainty and then it doesn't work out for some reason. You know, it's all part of it. That's absolutely true. Okay. So we could talk about pricing for hours Forever. and hours and hours. I love this. <laughs> we could. But I know there's a lot of great content that we can direct people towards. But mm-hmm. last question is, yes, ma'am. when I ask you what it means to be a wild woman, what is that to you? I think it's having the courage to really trust in yourself. And this may not be the definition that most people have, but I think, especially for a lot of women, myself included, you know, at times I just don't have enough trust in myself. And I think that I could live more freely and wildly if I did. I love that. Trust True confessions. <laughs> Your confessions. Okay. So if people want to go find you online to learn more about what you do, where can they go? Yep. They can head over to the pricinglady.com and then on all the social media, it's also pricing lady. So it's pretty easy to find. Sweet. I love it. Well, Janine, Janine as the French will say it. (laughs) Thanks for joining us today. That was awesome. Yeah. It was a real pleasure to be here, Renee. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. So there you have it. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Into the Wild. To make this girl happy and to help reach other women who are dreaming of starting their business, please leave us a five-star review on iTunes and everywhere you listen in. Also, if you want to find me in the wild, check me out on Instagram at Renee underscore Warren. That's R-E-N-E-E underscore W-A-R-R-E-N. And leaving you with one of my favorite tips of all time, The best advice you could ever receive is from someone who has successfully done it before you. Until next time, ladies, peace out.